What's going on everybody? It's your boy Gage. Welcome to the channel. Today, we are taking a time capsule all the way back to the year 2010 so that I can show you my build of my zombie deck from all the way back in 2010 Edison format. For those that aren't familiar, this is a deck that is only going to be utilizing cards that were available up until 2010 and will be utilizing the ban list of that era. So it is always great to be able to take a break from the current modern metagame to be able to play a slower paced, more interactive format such as Edison. And I have really been enjoying playing that format. This is just one of many decks that I intend on showcasing that are from that era, and I can't wait to share my build with you today. But before I do, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I greatly appreciate it, especially if you are fans of content like this. So let's go ahead and start by discussing the absolutely gorgeous boss monster for the deck, which is Dark Armed Dragon. Just an absolute menace. One of the most powerful boss monsters of the old school era. Dark Armed Dragon is perfect for dark decks because it can only be special summoned from your hand by having exactly three monsters in the graveyard. And you can banish a monster from your grave to target a card on the field and destroy that target. And because we are playing with old school rules, it does mean that you have the ability to activate that effect utilizing priority, meaning that unless this is getting hit with a Solemn of some kind, most of the time you are going to be able to remove something that your opponent controls pretty much immediately. This is an absolute bomb. It is not once per turn, so if you have... Uh, those three darks in the grave, you can just keep banishing them from the graveyard and completely obliterating your opponent's board. It doesn't always come up, but when you are able to establish the three darks, this card is an absolute menace and a staple in these kinds of decks. So one dark arm dragon is necessary. I am also playing another dark monster, the best tribute summon in the game at this time which is Caius the Shadow Monarch. Amazing card when it's Tribute Summoned. You can target a card on the field and banish it. And if it is a Dark Monster, your opponent inflicts 1,000 points of damage. A lot of people might think that having three copies of this card might be a little overkill, but because we are able to special summon a lot with this deck, it means that oftentimes we have fodder to be able to tribute into him. Additionally, we are playing cards like Allure of Darkness, and he is just one of the best dark monsters to have. You don't have to worry about banishing one of them because you will still have access to two other copies in the deck. However, I can see arguments for potentially dropping him down to one or two, depending on your preference. Uh, but Caius is just incredible. He also gives you the ability to potentially burn for game because he does have the ability to banish himself. And because he's a dark monster, if your opponent is at 1,000 life points or less, you can essentially make it so that you can burn them for that last 1,000 and steal games. So Caius is a fantastic card. Again, one of the best tributes in Edison format. And that's why I'm happy that I can play three copies in this build. And, of course, for the zombie portion of it, we are playing two copies of Goblin Zombie. He is at two in this format. If not, I would absolutely play a third. Uh, he has two great effects when he inflicts battle damage to the opponent. You could send the top card of the deck to the graveyard, so disrupting your opponent. And when this is sent from the field to the graveyard, you can add a zombie-type monster with 1,200 or less defense from the deck to your hand, and that does include himself. So this is just a very, very good recruiter for the zombie archetype. Obviously, it is something that you can get off of other cards like Pyramid Turtle. You can special summon it off of Book of Life. Goblin Zombie is a dark monster, so a lore of darkness is perfect for him. And of course, he's going to be able to help set up your dark arm dragon plays. This is a fantastic card because 
even if you end up using it, for example, as a synchro summon, which this deck revolves around doing, that means you are then going to get a plus off of using him for a synchro summon. If you tribute him for Caius, his effect will also trigger. He is just a very, very powerful and uh, honestly the namesake and a reason to play zombies, and that's why you have to play two copies. I'm also playing two copies of Mystic Tomato. Unfortunately, not a zombie. However, he is a dark type monster and it can help be fuel to either get you into your goblin zombies or can help you set up dark arm dragon plays. So this deck, you know, it does require a little bit of setup. Uh, and that's why we are playing the recruiters that we are. But once the deck gets going and the engine is set up, honestly, the recursion that it offers and the OTK potential is something to be wary of. So I opted for two copies of Mystic Tomato for those reasons. I'm also playing two copies of Zombie Master. Just absolutely incredible. You can, once per turn, send a monster card from the hand to the grave to special summon a level 4 or lower zombie-type monster from either player's graveyard. So this does give you the opportunity to bring back your Plague Spreaders for free, for example, meaning that you do not have to use the uh, Plague Spreaders effect to actually uh, stack a card from your hand to bring it back. Uh, and so, therefore, it will not get banished when it's sent to the graveyard. So that does mean that it gives you the opportunity to use Plague Spreader Zombie multiple times. You could also use this to bring back something like your Goblin Zombie, uh, meaning that if you are going for a potential Synchro play, it makes it easier for you to do so if you already have access to Plague Spreader on the field. If you already have a Zombie in the graveyard, it means that uh, you can essentially discard one card and you can end up reviving that same card that you ended up discarding as long as it's a zombie. So Zombie Master is really what allows for the deck to continue to grind over and over, and that is why I do play two copies. And as I alluded to earlier, two copies of Pyramid Turtle. Very good floater, uh, being able to get you special summon a zombie monster from the deck with 2,000 or less defense. So that does pretty much include all your zombies, specifically your zombie master. Also giving you early access to your Plague Spreader zombie if you need to start going for some synchro plays. The only thing is that, unfortunately, he is not a dark type monster, which does, uh, he's one of uh, only two in the deck that are non-darks, so it is very low probability that you will not be able to get off your Allure of Darkness, but I ended up opting for the second Mystic Tomato as opposed to going for the third Turtle, and I have enjoyed it. So uh, I can see arguments for decreasing or increasing the ratio, but two has been a sweet spot for me. And I'm playing one copy of Spirit Reaper, the ability to stall out because it cannot be destroyed as a result of battle means that your opponent is going to be forced to use some of their power cards to be able to get rid of it because when it is targeted, it is destroyed. So they might have to do something like utilize a mind control or something along those lines just to be able to get rid of it. So the fact that you have the ability to stall if for whatever reason you are unable to set up your plays means that this is going to always be a good option, and the fact that it is a dark as well as a level 3 means that you are also able to go for certain synchro monsters that you would normally not have access to. So Spirit Reaper is a very good card in the deck, and that's why I still play one copy. And I'm playing a Necrogardna. It is a graveyard-based strategy, so it is easy to be able to just kind of get this into the graveyard um, and to be able to stop one of your opponent's attacks by banishing it from the graveyard. So, again, level 3, it's a dark, it just has a lot of synergy. It's not necessarily a zombie type, but I do think the fact that it is a graveyard-based deck means that this is a card that can help you in a pinch if your opponent is trying to, for example, take out one of your stronger synchro monsters, you can then protect it from that battle. If your opponent is trying to go for game, you can uh, stop your opponent by ruining their math. Necrogardna is just an all-around solid card. I'm also playing one copy of Sangan. Uh, being able to add a monster with 1,500 or less from the deck to your hand means that 
a very, very large percentage of the cards that are in your deck currently are going to be searchable. You can't search for the boss monsters, you can't search for the zombie masters, but pretty much any of your floaters, the Necrogardena, all the other cards that I have mentioned up until this point are searchable. He is also a dark level three, so like I mentioned, uh, being able to get access to certain synchro plays like your Cataster is very nice to have. And a copy of Mizuki. Of course, it's a zombie deck. Unfortunately, this is the other card in the deck that is a earth type and not a dark type. It would have been perfect if he was because you can banish this card from your grave to target a zombie monster in the grave and special summon it. This is why I say the deck has, has so much recursion and is very scary to play against. It gives you the ability to potentially have yet another activation for your Plague Spreader Zombie so that you can continue to go for Synchro plays. If you already go into one of your extra deck Synchro Monsters, for example, your Doom Kaiser or your Revive King Hades, it means that they also get an extra chance to hit the battlefield. It is just a very strong card. I wish I could play multiples, but unfortunately, the fact that it is not a dark type really does hinder the strategy. So just keeping it at one has been a nice spot for me. And as I mentioned earlier, Plague Spreader Zombie is really what makes this deck as good as it is. Having the ability to access in archetype zombie synchro monsters is very, very strong. This also gives you, of course, access to the other generic extra deck monsters in the format that are powerful because of the fact that you could always just normal summon this. You can always use its own ability in a pinch to stack a card in your hand to revive him from the graveyard. You can bring it back off of Mizuki. You can bring it back off of Zombie Master. You really don't want to use the ability to stack unless you really, really have to, because if you do, it will get banished when it leaves the field. And you really want to have as many opportunities to abuse this Plague Spreader Zombie as you can, because that is what will allow you to end up winning in the grind game. So Plague Spreader Zombie is one of the most powerful cards that you can be playing for the deck for sure. And I am playing one copy of Tragodia along with Gores. These are uh, essentially battle monsters. Uh, if your opponent attacks into you in different ways, you can bring them out to essentially allow you to survive. The Tragodia in particular being very strong because if you take any battle damage, regardless of whether or not you have other monsters on the field. You can special summon him, and he gains 600 attack and defense for every card in your hand. If you have a lot of cards in your hand, that means he can actually get very, very beefy, and your opponent might not be expecting for you to drop a bomb that potentially has, you know, 3,000 attack. <laughs> so there are uh, instances in which you might want to be able to hold this for when you do have a larger hand size so that you can catch your opponent off guard. And then it also has two other pretty useful abilities as well. Once per turn, you can send a monster from your hand to the grave, which you don't care about because this is a zombie deck, and then target one of your opponent's face-up cards with the same level as the sent monster and take control of it. So you get to essentially snatch steal one of your opponent's monsters as long as you have the respective type. So if your opponent has a level four, you can pitch something like your zombie master and take it. If they just so happen to have a level two, you can pitch your plague spreader, which would be crazy. Uh, there are just a lot of different ways you can utilize it. It also has the ability where once per turn, you could target a monster in your graveyard, and this card's level becomes the same as that target's. We are playing level twos, level threes, level fours, level sixes. There are many times in which you may be able to end up uh, getting into a synchro play that your opponent may not have been anticipating because of the fact that you can essentially copy the level of the monster. Meaning that in the late game, when your graveyard is pretty stacked up, which most of the time it will be, your Tragodia can be any level that you want it to be. The Gores also just a amazing staple in this format. When you take damage, then you can special summon him from the field uh, to the field, as long as you control no cards, and you are going to be able to then special summon the Gores along with a token that has the stats of the monster that was used to attack you. So 
This is a format warping card because of the fact that your resp- your opponent always has to respect the fact that you may have this in your hand. You're a zombie deck, you're a dark deck, so most of the time they are going to be wary of attacking into you in a certain way. This is most of the time the reason why your opponent will be forced to attack with some of their weaker monsters first before going in for attacking with a larger monster. Because if you do want to bring this to the field, uh, usually you're going to want to wait until your opponent attacks with their strongest monster because then the token will gain the stats of that monster. So if your opponent has, I don't know, a blue eyes, it's 3,000 attack. If they attack directly with that blue eyes and you're still alive afterwards, then you can bring out the gores, special summon that token, and it has 3,000 attack, meaning that you will be able to crash with the blue eyes next turn. So um, just an example, but just very good cards. They're dark types for Allure of Darkness, though most of the time you're really not going to want to have to end up banishing, so it would feel bad if you did. But the opportunity to just be able to, uh, to draw extra cards is too good to pass up. And I am playing two copies of Krebons. This is because we are, in fact, playing the one copy of Emergency Teleport. So this is the Instant Fusion version of the deck that allows you to have access to even more synchro plays than the normal zombie build would. This is a modern deck philosophy in that the original versions of the zombie deck were much more recruiter-reliant, much more setup-reliant, and with the addition of this package, along with the Instant Fusion package that I'll discuss in a moment, it allows you to have much more proactive plays rather than having your opponent uh, attack into you. So the fact that Krebons is a dark, it is a level 2, and it is a tuner as well, means that you now have even more abilities to go into Synchro Monsters. You don't always have to rely on your Plague Spreader Zombie, and that is why I am playing the two and the one copy of Emergency Teleport. This is a very nice package that the deck has to offer, and it is even more busted with the aforementioned Instant Fusion. Instant Fusion is absolutely busted for this deck, because, like I mentioned, it gives you access to additional Synchro Monsters. I might as well just uh, show some of the examples of options that you have at your disposal. As you know, Instant Fusion allows you to pay a 1,000 life points to special summon a level 5 or lower Fusion Monster from the extra deck. It can't attack, and it is destroyed during the end phase, but none of that matters because most of the time you're going to be using this for either Tribute... um, Uh, fodder, or you are going to use it to synchro summon. So what are the options here? So I personally play Darkfire Dragon. It is a level four with our uh, level, level sixes for synchro monsters are some of the most broken in the game. So any opportunities that we have to be able to go into them are going to be ideal. So this along with your Plague Spreader or the Krebons allows you to go into your level sixes. Even more spicier is the Reaper on the Nightmare. The fact that it is level 5 and a zombie means that if you do end up using this, you can end up going into level 7s with your level 2 tuners. And level 7s are some of the most busted options that a lot of decks don't always have the ability to consistently go into. For example, you could go into an Arabellum, you can go into an Arcanite Magician to pop two cards on your opponent's side of the field. Uh, And then, of course, later down the line, because it's a zombie type, you can bring it back with Book of Life, which is just absolutely busted. Similarly to the Spirit Reaper, the main deck monster, it cannot be destroyed by battle. And if it does end up inflicting damage to your opponent, you are going to be able to randomly discard a card from their hand. So Reaper is just incredible for this deck. And of course, we are also playing one copy of Musician King because of the fact that Um, So, excuse me, in order to be able to get into the Arcanite, you do specifically need a Spellcaster. So, I did uh, misspeak. You can't get into it off of the Reaper. However, that is what the Musician King is for because of the fact that he is a level 5 Spellcaster that does allow you to go into the Arcanite Magician to pop two cards. So, 
as you can see, Instant Fusion just opens up a whole nother world of options for this deck. And that is why I choose to play it and encourage others to do so as well. As I mentioned earlier, this deck is all about kind of the modern philosophy of deck building. And that's why I'm playing three copies of Book of Life, which is a Monster Reborn and DD Crow built into one card. This is fantastic because it means that if your opponent is also playing a graveyard reliant strategy, maybe they're playing black wings and they're trying to set up bayous in their graveyard, you can banish that bayou, special summon one of your own um, zombie type monsters, and you're golden. I mean, that that is a very big power play in a format that is slow as this, and that is why I want to play three copies. I can see arguments for less because you don't necessarily want to brick on it, but I love the ability to be able to get back into the game. And this is one of the best cards that you can top deck later on in the game that can actually help you get back into it. I'm playing one copy of Allure of Darkness. I've mentioned it pretty much throughout the entire video. Draw two cards, banish a dark monster from your hand. If you do not, then you have to send your entire grave uh, hand to the graveyard. Obviously, we don't want that to happen, which is why we are maximizing on as many good darks that make sense for this deck in particular. So Allure of Darkness, just being able to allow you to sculpt your hand in the way that you need and potentially get you back in the game in a top deck situation is just very good, too good to pass up. We are also playing Heavy Storm. There's a lot of really powerful back row strategies in this format. A lot of uh, power cards that you really don't want to have to worry about. You don't want your opponent bottom, uh, bottomlessing your monsters. You don't want them hitting your monsters with D-Prison or Mirror Force. Heavy Storm makes it so that you can essentially clear the field and make way for your big plays. Foolish Burial is pretty self-explanatory. Sending a monster from the deck to the graveyard. It is a graveyard-based strategy, so getting any monster that you would like into the graveyard, like your Plague Spreader Zombie, is just busted. We're playing one Mystical Space Typhoon, targeting a Spell or Trap on the field and destroying it. The fact that this is chainable means that uh, a lot of the times I will end up setting this card and waiting for my opponent to set their own cards. Sometimes I end up trading with my opponent's Mystical Space Typhoon, but it is good to know that at, if even in that instance, it is a card that I don't necessarily have to worry about that could ruin my plays. This is a combo deck, so you really don't want, for example, your Plague Spreader as you're going for a Synchro play to get hit with something like a Book of Moon. There are going to be car certain cards where if your opponent is able to hit that choke point then you're pretty much screwed. So you really don't want to have to worry about it. So Mystical Space Typhoon is a must. And of course, we're playing Brain Control. Absolutely busted. Pay 800 life points to target a monster your opponent controls and take control of it. You can then end up using that for a synchro play. You can tribute over it, or you can even use it to attack for game. So there is a reason why this card is at one and honestly is one of the most swingy and powerful spells in the current format. So you kind of have to play it in almost any deck that you uh, that that can utilize it. And that's it for the spells. So for the traps, I'm going to quickly go over it. Compulsory Evacuation Device is just a very versatile card in that you can use it to send one of your opponent's uh, monsters to the hand if you end up doing that for one of their extra deck monsters. That means you're just for free getting their extra deck monster back into the extra deck so that you don't have to think about it. Uh, and you can use it defensively if you feel as though your card is going to end up for example, being targeted by a Caius, you can then compulsory your own monster back to the hand so that you don't have to worry about it getting banished. So I like the flexibility that this card provides, and you really want to also have defensive cards. You don't necessarily just want all gas. Um, the, the thing is, you want to make sure that some of your own things stick, and that's why compulsory evacuation device is just uh, great to have. I am also playing Torrential Tribute. It is a blowout card. You really want to just have it as many ways to make sure that you stay alive. So being able to destroy all monsters on the field when a monster is summoned, that goes for you and your opponent. So you can even trigger this yourself. There have been many times where I have, for example, normal summoned a goblin zombie, torrentialed myself, uh, uh, 
uh, torrentialed the entire board, so clearing my opponent's monsters as well as my monster, and then triggering my goblin zombie to be able to get that free search. So uh, the torrential tribute is pretty good in this deck. Bottomless is also very powerful. So there are sometimes your opponent brings out a monster that you don't want to deal with, and you could just banish it and not have to worry about it. Of course, we're playing Mirror Force. Blowout cards, cards that can help get you back in the game, are a must. And Mirror Force is a card that most still have to respect, because if they do not, and they end up leaving a bunch of monsters in attack position, for example, they're going to lose their entire field. So Mirror Force is still good, along with one copy of of Dimensional Prison. Because we're playing so many one-ofs, it can be very difficult for your opponent to be able to play around so many different types of interruptions. And in my opinion, these are just the best types of interruptions you can be playing. So I'm going to go over the extra deck. I already discussed some of the options that we have at our disposal, such as the instant fusion targets. These are just very good at helping you get into different types of synchro monsters. As mentioned earlier, there are level 7s that we have access to thanks to Instant Fusion. With the Musician King, you can use it to go into the Arcanite to pop cards. And even with the um, with your Reaper, you can use it to go into an Urbellum. And this has the ability where if your opponent has four or more cards in their hand, you can place one random card from their hand to the top of the deck. So if your opponent does not have an answer for the Urbellum, that may very well spell game right then and there because that means that they are never going to end up seeing a new card in their hand because you're constantly stacking it every single turn. So Urbellum is very, very powerful, and that's why I like having access to these. I'm playing the one Chimera Tech Fortress Dragon. I am playing Cyber Dragon in the side deck. So if I am going up against a machine-based strategy, you don't want to be caught with your pants down. You want to have a copy of Chimera Tech. And so I am playing the one copy. Ally of Justice Cataster, we are playing a bunch of different level threes in the deck. And this is just one of the most powerful level, uh, level fives that you can go into. As I mentioned earlier, we are also playing a multitude of different zombie type uh, extra deck monsters. The Doom Kaiser Dragon allows you, when it is special summoned, to select a zombie type monster in your opponent's grave and special summon it to your side of the field. So you can use that to grab opposing Plague Spreader zombies if your opponent is also playing that card. Some people are also cheeky and will play Zombie World, which changes the type of your opponent's monsters as well. That is Pretty matchup dependent, um, but it can be very good because it means that you then have the ability to special summon one of your opponent's monsters from their graveyard because the zombie world will make it zombie type. So it's pretty cheeky. Uh, I will say that there have been instances in which I've tested it and it does not always come up. So uh, I would just rather have it because sometimes I will just go into this first if I don't uh already have a, an option to go into. That way I could just bring it back off of the Book of Life later on. Revive King also just being very, very strong in the fact that it can negate the effects of effect monsters destroyed by battle with zombie type monsters you control. So it doesn't necessarily have to be destroyed by the Revive King. If you end up attacking it into a floater, they're not going to be able to get their effects. Things like that. Revive King is just very nice to have and can be revivable later on with Book of Life. Level six monsters are some of the most powerful in the game and there is none more broken than Brianak, Dragon of the Ice Barrier, being able to discard any number of cards to return the same number of cards from the field to the hand. This does include being able to bounce your own cards if the time calls for it, but usually this is going to be used to clear your opponent's field. And because you're discarding cards, it's a zombie deck. So a lot of the times those cards are going to be want are going to want to be put in there, whether it's the plague spreader, whether it is the um your your different types of zombie monsters that you can revive off of your zombie master, whether it's your Mizuki. Uh, Brianak is just an incredible card, and you have to play it. Goyo Guardian is also an amazing card. This is pre errata so it does not require an Earth Tuner, just a regular Tuner. So when it destroys an opponent's monster by battle, you can special summon that monster in the field in defense position. So you can deny your opponent the resource 
that they would have gained, there are going to be times in which you might want to use this to grab your opponent's treeborn frogs from their graveyard. You might want to be able to keep them off of their own synchro plays if they have a plague spreader, things of that nature. That is why Goyo is just a mainstay as a level 6. We're also playing Flamvel. I'm not even going to attempt it, <laughs> which allows you to essentially do piercing battle damage. So there are going to be times where you need to go for game, and this is one of the perfect options to select. And for the level 7s, we are also playing Black Rose Dragon. This is always going to be a staple option to go into when it's Synchro Summoned. Destroy all cards on the field. So this is fantastic for helping to get you back into the game. So you have to play it, in my opinion. And then for the level 8s, I am playing Thought Ruler Archfiend and Stardust Dragon. These are staples in the format. The Thought Ruler, when it destroys an opponent's monster by battle and sends it to the grave, you can gain life points equal to that monster's original attack. And if a Spell or Trap tries to target this card in particular, uh, usually it's also other Psychic Monsters, but we're really not playing all that many in this deck. The fact that the only other target would be Krebons, but most of the time it would not already still be on the field. But you could pay a 1,000 to prevent it from being targeted. So that means that some of their power plays, like Brain Control, Control are no longer uh, in play, and you don't have to worry about some of those power cards coming to bite you. And Stardust Dragon being able to protect your cards from being destroyed is fantastic. It is a quick effect, so if you are able to manually summon this, it means that you will then have the ability to bring it back later down the line. So that is it for the main deck. I'll quickly go over my side deck. Honestly, not really too much to write home about. I don't really uh, <laughs> have the opportunity to side against too many different types of strategies, but I have one built just in case, and it's only 13 cards. So it uh, just goes to show that it is still kind of incomplete, but this deck is still a work in progress. Um, two copies of Cyber Dragon, again, machine-based strategies. I'm also playing, funny enough, two copies of Karibo. There are some decks, like the Dragon Turbo or the Gaia deck, that allow you to OTK. I do not want to get OTK. This deck, like I mentioned, it does need a bit of setup. And so uh, it's funny that you would have to play something like this. But it is a dark monster, so it does have a bit of synergy in the worst case that you do just need to use it as a banishing target. Or if you do need to set up your Dark Arm Dragon. DD Crow, just a staple hand trap, being able to banish cards from your uh, opponent's graveyard uh, and, and just not having to deal with it. Lightning Vortex along with Giant True Nade. Lightning Vortex discarding a card. Again, zombies want to be there. And then uh, destroying all of your opponent's card uh, monsters. And then Giant True Nade, making it so you don't have to worry about spells and trap cards. Dust Tornado, again, spell and trap cards are your worst uh, enemy, you really do not want to walk into spells and traps that could end up ruining your day. And I am overkill playing three copies of Pulling the Rug. Absolutely insane counter trap, which for essentially free, when a monster effect is activated, that activates when it is normal summoned. So like a Deep Sea Diva or a Monarch or anything like that, you negate and destroy it. So yeah, this is insane. I'm glad that it got the reprint, which is why I, I picked up three copies. But guys, that is going to be it from me. Thank you so, so much if you managed to stick around this long. If you play the deck, what are some of the techs that you decide to play? What are some of the options that you use if you decide to go the instant fusion route? Uh, are there different ratios that you typically choose? Uh, if you are interested in playing the deck and got inspiration from me, definitely let me know. And thank you again for sticking around up until this point. I very much intend on making similar types of content in the future. So until next time, thank you so much and have a great day.